In Matthew 28, um, there's some verses we want to look at, very popular, very familiar. But um, I'm going to start this message off today, and uh, we'll call this one, One Last Command. If Adam's, this is what I've been thinking through the, through the um, resurrection season as we were going through it. This is what was going through my mind when I was not able to share these thoughts with you. But the, the thought that just kept reoccurring to me is that if one command in the Garden of Eden being disobeyed by Adam and his bride Eve, if one disobedience to one command brought so much heartache and hurt into this will, world, how much did one act of obedience of Jesus Christ going to the cross bring blessing to this world, right? I mean, literally, obedience to one command, which was to go to the cross, changed our world. It's arguably changed by that. So I'm going to just add one little caveat to that. One last little thing is then, I wonder what obedience by the church to one last command of Jesus could do for our world. Could you agree with me our world could use a little bit of help? A lot of help. And we know that Jesus is the answer, okay? So we, we get that. But I want you to hear it again with fresh ears. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And depending on how you answer this question is going to determine what kind of a church we will be. It will also determine what kind of impact we will have. So there's a lot, there's a lot here at stake. So I'm going to ask you to read along with me in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Just follow along. This is the end just prior to Jesus' ascension. So this happens after the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now he's going back to the Father. Verse number 16, Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. He told them, hey, go to Galilee. I'll meet you there. Right? She's got them. You're amazing. She's, she's as intelligent as she is beautiful. Yeah. All right. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Every worship leader loves that. I mean, resurrected Jesus usually does it for most people, even Thomas, right? Resurrected Jesus standing in front of him, and some fall on their face and worship him. And others say, nah, I'm not buying that. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he had all authority in heaven before. There was no question about that. It was on the earth because that was given to Adam and his race. And then, you know, Adam and Eve fumbled and lost the keys and, you know, Satan picked him up and started doing stuff, right? Jesus, through his act of obedience, was able to get those keys. He snatched them out out of the hand of Satan. I would love to have seen Satan's face. Jesus just plucking them out of Satan's hand. And I mean, I'd love to have seen Jesus' face, you know. What was he like? Sort of a grin, I'm sure. And Satan, sort of scared, spitless, you know. I said spitless. All right. All right. It's for the live stream. <laughs> All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, connecting, 
therefore is based on verse 18, right? All authority has been given to me, so you go under what that authority, right? You go, therefore, and make disciples. Here's the important point. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Uh, at the end of Mark's gospel, he says, go and preach the gospel. See, like we hear that with, with our Gentile ears, but we don't hear Matthew with our Jewish ears. We should hear it with our Jewish ears because this is like, this is, this is 101 stuff. Okay. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Okay, so here's how we Gentiles hear that, especially in Western call. Go preach the gospel, save the sinners, and build the church. And Jesus said, no, he would build the church. You go preach the gospel. You preach the gospel, I'll build the church. Okay? And here's how we're going to do it, by making disciples. Somehow we missed that. Somehow we missed that. But because of the Reformation, Martin Luther, and because most of us are Gentiles, we connect to Paul, the apostle, not saying we shouldn't, we hear him with uh, an inner vibe of our Gentileness, our paganness, our being outside of the covenant of Israel. Do you understand? I mean, we just kind of hear that naturally as preach the gospel and get these people saved. Right? Because once they're saved, like, the work's done, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's okay. Most of you are ahead of me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's another thing. So missions is like in, in our, like, DNA. It has to be. And listen, if the Lord has not called you to go to a nation, then you need to help people get there who are called, and you, we really need to be discipling our own nation, right? Okay, so anyways, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Question is, are you a disciple? Second question is, are you helping to make disciples? Or are you in the process? Are you helping? Are you planting the seeds? Are you helping in some manner or form to uh, uh, make disciples? Making disciples is a big deal. I'll tell you why in just a moment. So after Jesus' uh, resurrection, the Father gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. He then turns to his disciples, these ones that were left. I mean, it was the 11. Um, Judas, of course, wasn't there. And, and, and then, you know, whoever else. But there were disciples who were standing there. And Jesus looks at them and he says, go and make disciples. This is the last command. Go make disciples of the nations, of the world. Okay, so a real honest question that came to me this, this uh, resurrection season, maybe partially because I was feeling sorry for myself because I wasn't going to be able to speak and things like that. Actually, now I'm glad that, that I wasn't able to speak because I was so blessed by everybody who did and I know you were too, and you should. And by the way, all those messages, uh, Jim's got them up there on YouTube now, and uh, they'll soon be on our website. But anyway, having said that, let me just tell you something that I thought about this, and I don't know if this means anything to you, but I think about what unbelievers think about. Like, so if Jesus is really the big deal, and if the resurrection was really a big deal, and if Jesus birth the church and that's really a big deal and he left the church to do this work 
of his to continue it, then that's, that's a really big deal. And then he ascends back to the Father and says, hey, guess what? I'm going to keep the gates of hell open by my intercession. You guys go do this thing. And uh, if all of that is a really big deal, and it is, then why isn't the world better than it is? In, in other words, what did Jesus get on the investment? So there's like theological um, shell games we can play with this. Okay, one of the shell games we can play is, hey, listen, you can't change who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. God has already predetermined that some will be saved, some will be lost. That's just how it is. And the church's job is just to worship Jesus and proclaim him as Lord. That's only partially true in my viewpoint. I think that that gets into some areas that are a little bit dubious. But what it creates is a, a flabby church, a church that just worships Jesus but doesn't actually do anything about changing the world. Another thing that uh, part of the shell game is another part of the church is like, we just kind of let go of the gospel part of this and the blood and the cross and all that objectionable stuff, and we'll just make the world a better place. Can I just share with you that I think that the church ought to be doing what only the church can do. A lot of people can do uh, social work very well, sometimes better than the church. But we need to be doing what only the church can do. This is where you get ecstatic. It's where you say amen. amen. That's a good word. Like, the church really needs to stay focused on the things that only we can do. Now, you know, we can worship the, uh, the Lord, and really only believers are going to be able to do that. And, and we can teach about Jesus, and only believers can really do that. Although our country's found a way to sort of do it, you know? Like you don't actually have to love Jesus to kind of talk about him. And especially if you think that Jesus was just a nice guy. He was really kind of like Mr. Rogers, you know? Just a really nice guy and who in the world would ever think of killing him? Well, certainly not me. You know, we just get away from the whole separation from God and sin issue and, you know, God having a purpose and a will and a plan and morality for people, which, by the way, is better for us. Hello? All right? So we, <clears throat> we can sort of play this shell game and just kind of say we're kind of getting the job done but like until we actually say, number one, I've become a disciple. Number two, I'm in the process of making disciples. We can't honestly say that the church is being fully obedient. So is it any reason? I mean, is there any one of the world's not really what it could be from what Jesus had really intended? Let me show you why I think that's true. Okay. Um. Carrie, I'm, I'm all over the place, so let's go to slide number two. A disciple of Jesus Christ is both a student and a follower. Let's just clear that up right now. Okay, so what is a disciple? What is a disciple really? A disciple of Jesus Christ is both a student and a follower of Jesus Christ, following faithfully his teachings, following faithfully his spirit, following faithfully his example. Does that make sense? So we, as disciples, we are student and follower. Now, let me just say that as a young man, very young man, uh, I, you know, at 14, I was saved. At 18, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And at 19, I was depressed. <laughs> Because I, I had zeal and passion and loved Jesus and read his scriptures. And I looked at the church and I said, hey, that ain't anything like I'm reading in my Bible, you know. It's nothing like that. So then I started talking about the kingdom of God and, uh, and, and discipleship. And so the, my, my home church decided to uh, fix the problem, they, they sent us to plant this church. <laughs> so, you, know, you know, I was teach I was a young man teaching, I was teaching kingdom of God, I was teaching discipleship a, a, to a, an adult class, I was in their leadership, I was all about, I loved them, I, I went through a, a time of being dis 
discouraged with the church, uh, disillusioned with the church, wanting to wish that I wasn't a part of the church, wanting to get rid of the church, to all of a sudden saying, wait a second, the church is the delivery system. It's God's body, Jesus' body on the earth. Oh, this is his girlfriend. I got to, like, work with this thing. I've got to find a way to work with this thing. So I started teaching in an adult class, and guess what? I found those adults were actually very comfortable with where they were at. There are people in this room who right now today are probably comfortable with where your life is at and where it's going and the expectations. But I'm telling you, you were hardwired for adventure. You were hardwired for joy. You were hardwired for freedom. And it's never going to happen until you get connected to this thing called discipleship. Okay. I'll try to make my point. In Luke chapter 6, verse 39, he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Obvious answer is no. Will they not both fall into a ditch? Luke 6, 39. Luke 6, 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Okay. So here's how the church has been dealing with it, and I understand it. This thing's falling off, so we just go put it down. We teach this. We say, are you saved? Are you, have you accepted Christ? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? That is really, really important. So we extend to them the gospel, and that is that God doesn't actually hate us. He loves us so much that he gave his son to come and die for us in our place. And so we can be re uh, reconciled. We can be re reunited with the Father. We can actually come back to fellowship and relationship with him. That's really good news. And then we teach you that you don't have to earn this. This thing is a gift. Like, I got my mom a gift. I gave my gift to my mom. She didn't have to do anything except be alive. It's a gift. Sometimes we misunderstand this. So when, when we get a hold of that, that a gift is a gift, like salvation is a gift... It changes us. It's like, I don't have to struggle to earn God's love. He already loves me, and he's proved it. And by the way, in those days when you don't feel loved, just remember the cross and the resurrection. It forever settles it, or it should. Like, like the Fogel family has been forever changed by the death of their daughter, a needless one, a forever change has occurred to that family they'll never forget that how could we forget the death of god's own son it should forever change us we should never struggle with it again he loves us okay so we find that and then when we find that then all of a sudden it's like so i don't i i, I sort of stop worrying about earning god's love and then after time, I get so adjusted to this that I, I get a little sloppy in my devotional life, and then I get a little sloppy in my, my moral life, and then I start getting a little sloppy. And then, then I start, you know, my, my, my attendance, my plugging in with the church, I get a little sloppy with, I'm pointing at Stephanie, not because she's having troubles plugging into the church, but because of your reference to the root system there earlier. We, we struggle a little bit with all of this, and then we sort of start to justify and say, but I know he loves me. I know he loves me. And then someone like me comes along and says, there's a lot of sloppy stuff going on in the church right now. And you read the letters to the book, uh, in the book of Revelation to Ephesus, to Laodicea. Uh, you, you know, you start reading those letters, you start saying, well, you know, the apostles started to see some, some laziness occurring. And so they, they doubled down on the instructions and stuff, you know. So we start instructing, and when we start instructing, then we sort of slide into this kind of thing of, is Jesus your Lord? Let me just settle this 
once and for all. He cannot be your Savior. He, as your Savior, he can't be not your Lord. I mean, you know, this, this is, he's either the Lord or he's not. He can't save you if he's not Lord. So we kind of start doing a shell game here and saying, is it possible that you love Jesus as your Savior, but you're not serving him as your Lord? So we're trying to fix a problem. And the problem is that we didn't start where Jesus told us to start. And that is to go make disciples. Guess what? Disciple, lifelong student. Disciple, lifelong follower. Well, from the point that you accept Jesus, right? So I don't want to make a distinction between accepting Jesus and being a disciple. I want to make a distinction between following Jesus and not following Jesus. Let me just give you an example here. In my own life, so I got um, this wonderful job working for a computer company, and, and, and you know, Jude, God was so gracious to us. When, when Judy and I got married, we were able to start with a starter home. We, got, we, we bought a house and got married, and we were able to move into that house. And so Judy's working full-time. I'm working full-time. We have a little bit of rental coming in with this house. So we, we've got like three incomes. And I get this job by the grace of God. I was just following Jesus and ran into a new job. And that job paid more than our three sources of incomes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God gave me this wonderful job. The only thing was it had to start out with 13 weeks up in New England training. So the experience I had got me in the door. The grace of God and favor of God got me in the door. But then I needed training. So I go for 13 weeks. Then I go back for seven weeks. Then I go back for five weeks. Then I go back for every once in a while for two or three weeks. But when I went there, that 13-week time period, I needed something to kind of keep me sane, you know, and focused and so I end up getting this book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so in my 13 weeks there, I am studying all of this computer stuff by day and by night. I'm doing this, this book. I'm reading this amazing book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which, by the way, since then I've gone back and reread it didn't move me like it did the first time. But the first time I read it, I just suddenly got this crazy notion that Jesus was calling me to be a disciple. I was already Christian. I was already Christian. By the way, in Acts eleven twenty six. 26... Barnabas, when he found Paul, brought him to Antioch. An entire year, Paul and Barnabas meet together at the church, and they taught considerable numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Jesus never once said, you're going to be my Christians. That was the world defining the terms. You guys remind me of Jesus. You're like little Christ. And the, and the disciples would say, well, he lives within us. Oh, so you're the Christ-ins. So the Christ-ins, that's what they started calling the disciples. It was a sect of Judaism. Some people called it the way because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know? So there was trouble with terms all the way back then. But it was not so for Jesus. Jesus walked in the middle of, of Judaism and teaches them to come follow him. And then at the end of his ministry, he says, go make disciples. So I'm reading this book, and I'm in a place, and they give me money to live on. They give me a two-bedroom apartment to live in. They give me a rental car. I have everything I could possibly need except my wife and my young son all the way back here 
in Pennsylvania. Well, I was homesick for sure. I had everything I need. I'm reading a book, and I'm hearing the Lord calling me to come follow him. And I just remember, like, the spot. It was snow. It had snowed. It was snowing. It was mostly done snowing. I put my shoes and coat on and went for a walk, and I'm walking across this beautiful field in New England area around our complex that we were living in and um, just decided to take a walk. And somewhere between leaving the apartment and reaching a furthermost destination, somewhere in there, I said to Jesus, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Please do not mistake this with a call to the ministry. That happened many years later many years later and I said yes and when I said yes can I tell you I was finally free because I was no longer my own I had been saved I had been baptized in water I had been baptized in the Holy Spirit but I'm walking across this field and I say yes to following Jesus and I'm finally free and I'm finally filled with joy Joy just came from every direction. I was so happy to be free. And I was finally fully devoted to Jesus, and I knew it. I knew I crossed the line with him. Would you please stand with me? I knew that I had crossed the line with the Lord. When... The Lord did call us into ministry. I was being interviewed by Pastor Paul Wislocki and a team of people, people I had a lot of respect for, and they're actually going to say yes or no to me coming into the ministry, me being granted a license in the Assemblies of God to minister and as we're going around the room and we're talking, people are grilling me and they're asking me questions. They're asking uh, all kinds of questions about my life and my calling and my testimony. And I'll never forget, Pastor Paul Wislocki said to me, Rich, I just want to ask you one question. And so all I want to ask is this one question. The question is, why do you think you will survive? Why do you think you will make it? And I looked at him and I said, Pastor Paul, with all due respect, a long time ago, I heard the voice of the Lord calling me to follow him, and I promised to follow him the rest of my life. If you guys grant me a license or not, it makes no difference to me. When I walk out of this room, I will walk out the same way I walked in as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will follow him all the days of my life. I'm a student of Jesus Christ. I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. He is the center point in my life. Nothing else matters. He comes before my family. He comes before my employment. He comes before everything. You can think what you want to think of me, but I'm telling you something. I'll walk out of here with my head held high, knowing this one thing, sir. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, I've been faithful to that. By the way, Pastor Paul was thrilled. He just, just absolutely loved that answer. He loved that answer. I was just being honest. And I'm going to be honest with you. This, the church in Western culture has forgotten to make disciples. And therefore, we have a lot of people saved, and they're Christians, but we're a mess. And it's not because we need more inner healing. God knows we need that. It's not because we've abandoned the Bible. God knows we need more literacy. It's because we've abandoned following Jesus. So listen, let me just tell you this. 
if I were to die tonight and never see you again, my life will have been absolutely complete because I heard Jesus call me to come follow him. If you've never heard him calling you to follow him, then I want you to hear him calling you right now. He's using my voice to do it. He's calling you to come follow him. He's calling you. Will you come and follow Jesus? We, you know, like we follow his example. We follow his teachings. I don't know why Christians are struggling with forgiveness issues. You don't have an option. You don't have an option. I don't know why we're struggling with so many issues. You don't have an option. When you follow Jesus, will you follow Jesus? And if the answer is yes, or if you've already said, you know, Pastor, I, I am a follower of Jesus, then I'm going to ask you this. Will you make disciples? Will you be a part of leading people to follow Jesus? Father, I ask right now, in the sacredness of this moment, that, that we would hear more than me. I, that we would hear in this this is like Jesus is walking right down the road here. And he decided to stop off at 32 South Front Street in Warmleysburg. And he walked in here today. And he, said, and he would say to us, I thank you for your worship. I thank you for your giving. I thank you for your surrender. But I have a question. Will you follow? me no matter what the cost will you follow me in the ukraine right now to follow jesus has a huge cost in north korea to follow jesus is a huge cost in china to follow jesus there's a huge cost in afghanistan in iraq in iran to follow jesus there's a huge cost See, the cost is the cross. It always is. If you're going to follow Jesus, there'll be a moment when you're going to have to lay your life down and say, I surrender. Jesus, you win. I will follow you. I will follow you. I just want to personally... If you just excuse me, I know we're over time. Sorry. I just need to say something to the Lord. You can hear if you want. You can tune out if you want. Jesus, it's been a privilege to follow you. And I have no idea why you passed my way. I have no idea why you would give me a, a wonderful job and take me to another city. Just to hear you call my name and ask me to follow you. But I am so thankful. I am so, so very thankful that you called my name. If I had 10,000 lives to live, I would live them all for you, Jesus. I would follow you. In death, in life, in hardship, in good times and bad times, I would follow you with all those lives. But you've given me one life. And with what I have of this life, I pledge you I will follow you still to the end, to the end. This morning, I just needed to clear my conscience. There's lots of questions, but we're going to take a journey through the book of Mark, and I'm going to show you what it means to follow Jesus. But it, it would just 
thrill me if you if we could just take a minute here at the altar i'm not asking you to come and sob i'm not asking you to come and do anything but to present yourself to the lord i'm going to ask you to respond to this question from jesus will you follow him will you follow jesus and will you make disciples of all men all it's really ethos all ethnicities all would you follow jesus can we just come and present ourselves to the lord for just two minutes i know we got to go just two minutes will you follow jesus are you a disciple would you be one will you make disciples will you be involved in planting seeds I know we can't make anyone be anything they don't want to but there's a way to do this it's called planting seeds Jesus I will follow you Jesus I will follow you I will follow you all the days of my life I will follow you God, if you give me grace and strength whenever I can, wherever I can, I'm going to plant a seed and I'm going to call people to follow Jesus. Going to plant a seed. I'm going to be a part. There's some elderly, they're older. Let's just say older. And I'm thinking 40s and above, you know need to take a young person aside, put your arm around them and say, look, I want to help you to follow Jesus. I want to help you follow Jesus. Yeah, being saved is a part of following Jesus. That's for sure. Yeah, don't disagree there. It starts with following. In fact, the disciples belonged to a group even before they believed in Jesus. So we are here right now, Lord, to commit our lives to follow you. Families raising their children to follow Jesus. I don't buy this nonsense that our children have to stray away and become derelicts. I just don't, I don't buy that. They can follow Jesus. They can follow Jesus. They're going to follow your example, probably. My example. Our kids can follow Jesus. Yeah. Here we are, Lord. Following you starts right here, right now, by our yes. By our yes. It starts right here, right now, with my yes. My yes, I will follow Jesus. Father. Hallelujah. This is why Jesus would pray after the psalmist Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus had done that a thousand times before he hung on the cross. I follow you, Jesus. I will follow you. Follow your example. Follow your teachings. I will follow your spirit. Because I am a disciple of Jesus. Hey, you want to shake it up? Start telling people, Instead of saying, I'm a Christian, why don't you start saying, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. If the form says Christian, Muslim, Hindu, other, check off the other. Write in disciple. Yeah. We need to start a movement. We need to start a new movement. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Praise your name. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this people. They're so gracious and generous and kind. 
They're so wonderful, so warm, so accepting. I thank you. It is a great privilege and honor to serve you by serving them. Now, Lord, I pray that we would shoulder together one last command to make disciples, to make disciples. In fact, that can be a question. Like when you're trying, you're struggling trying to make a decision, and you can't quite make a decision, say, is this going to make more disciples or not? If it's not, you may want to just put it on hold. Too many people making their own choices, making their own pathway, and they're making a mess of things. Follow Jesus. He'll never lead you astray. Follow Jesus. He will never lead you astray. Follow Jesus. He will never lead you astray. He'll lead you into the will of God. He'll lead you into the purposes of God. Follow Jesus. He'll never lead you astray. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord Jesus.